What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Loud Spot. I'm your host, Sebastian, with the Pantheon Podcast Network. Today, we have a special guest, Mr. Mark Scheffler, and we got, he got, hopefully, some stories to tell. Here we go. Before we get the show started, I do want to remind everyone to please subscribe to our YouTube channel and check us out on all podcasting platforms. We have Kyler joining us, our co-host today, and then Mr. Mark Scheffler, who is a writer, producer, actor, and has done some other things, which we're going to talk about. So, Mark, all the way out in Southern California, Kyler's over there in Northern California. How are you doing today, Mark? Doing great. Thanks for having me, man. Fun. Let's have some fun. Yeah, yeah I know Kyler has at least... Oh, Kyler's cutting out a little bit. I want to play the clip from Last House on the sure. Left right and your character, Junior. And this is, I guess, you getting bullied to shoot yourself. Yeah, this is towards the end of the movie. Yep, towards so. the end of the movie. So here we go with this clip right now. Beginning of the end of the movie. in the back, that little bump in the front. I want you to kind of get him lined up. That's right. Oh. No, 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 you're not shaking that much. I know you can aim the gun. Just get him lined up. No. Pull the trigger. Come on. Pull the trigger. I've got to get him. I've got to kill you, Krug. You always were a loser. Junior. I want to talk to you. Listen to Daddy. in your mouth and I want you to blow your brains out no. Oh, no, not of me. I want you to take the gun and I want you to put it in your mouth and I want you to blow your brains out no. blow your brains out blow your and th- there we go that scene we're gonna, we're gonna- Good job, good job. We're going to take a little break, yeah. and then we'll be right back after uh, this sponsored uh, commercial or advertisement. All right, we are back. Mark Scheffler is still here. Kyla was having some Wi-Fi issues, and so she has left, but I am going to talk with her later and hopefully get that fixed for future episodes. Okay, so we just watched the clip from Last House on the Left. My question to you is, as a comedian starting your career in uh, maybe stand-up comedy or doing comedy, how do you land a part that is a very serious role? Well, you know, I'll just tell you exactly the way it happened. And I, I don't know that's how you land a part, but that's how I did it. Or that's how it happened. Uh, yeah, so so that's the thing about show business, man. You talk to a thousand different people, you get a thousand different stories. A lot of them have similarities, but the stories are different. So I was uh, uh, had come off of working for a comedian uh, uh, by the name of London Lee, who I had met in the Casco Mountains when I was a stage manager there. I was 19. Uh, now I was 20 in New York City. I worked with London for a year, left after uh, a lot of club dates and two weeks at the Copacabana. Okay. And uh, yeah, so so uh, and I was I was his road manager, but part of his act as well. So I was on stage with him. So it was a it, brilliant experience. So then I went out on my own. I was doing little stand-up clubs, you know, standing up in New York, just, you know, nothing of any merit. Um, and I hooked up with uh, a manager by the name of Dick Towers who worked for uh, Lloyd Greenfield and Associates. And their two big clients at the time were Tom Jones and Engelbert Humperdinck. So they were yeah, you know, pretty the offices were in Rockefeller Center and they were, you know, pretty tapped in. So, um, you know, Dick had me running around for auditions here for commercials here and a couple of things happened. I think more on the commercial side. And uh, I walked into his office one day and he said, hey, I have a movie audition for you. 
hands me an address and said, ask for uh, uh, one of two guys, Wes or Sean, and tell them I sent you and uh, we'll see what happens. So I go down to their uh, to Sean's office. I go in. I meet Sean and Wes, a uh, tall, skinny, stringy haired, blonde kid. And uh, a Sean, a short, pudgy guy with a mustache. And uh, uh, they tell me about the movie. So, okay. And they hand me a script with some pages. And I looked and I read it. And they said, I said, just tell me a little bit about the character. And they said, um, he's a junkie. I said, and? And he said, well, you know, he's a junkie. And uh, he's like the son of the main bad guy. And yeah, I said, and? And that's about it. And I said, okay, uh, uh, so um, I, they gave me a scene to read, and the scene that I read for the audition was the uh, junior dream thing, where he's dreaming and comes out of the dream and whatever, and uh, I did it a couple of times. They said, thank you very much. I said, thanks for the time, good luck, and uh, left, went back to Dick's office, and by the time I had gotten back there, they'd already called and said, yep, that's the guy we want. So that's wow. how I got the part. That's the exact sequence of events. So you had no indication or no clue that you were going to get picked for the part. They just said, thank you. And then you, you walk out and then you get the part. Well, Not even- okay. It, look, you know, you go on enough auditions, you get a sense of cer- certain things, right? Like you definitely get a sense that unless you're a complete idiot and you never have understood the concept of reading the room, you, right. you, you know, when people don't like you and when the vibe isn't there and the, you do your best to not piss anyone off for the future and get the fuck out of there as quickly as possible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You don't yeah. try to, you, once you sense that the horse is dead, you don't start kicking it and telling it to move because it ain't moving. So the, you develop that. And I didn't sense that. It was very conge, you know, cordial. It was fun. It was friendly. Wes was great. Sean was great, you know. So I knew on a on a personal side that, you know, uh, there there was a okay. It was it was at the very least okay. And no, they didn't give me other than say you know good job or some kind of cursory uh, uh, pleasantry. I didn't get any indication that. Uh, you know, while I was walking back to Dick's office, they were calling him. Do you have a, a computer you can work a, as we speak? I do. Okay. So type in, in quotes, the once and future smash, end quote, and then hit enter. The once and future smash. We got trailers and clips here. Is it with uh, Jackie Kelly? Michael St. Michael's Mark Patton. Yes. I am in I am in a new mockumentary called The Once in Future Smash that I'm gonna just plug the crap out of now. Not so much because I'm in it. I'm plugging the crap out of the three people who are responsible for it. Uh, uh Neil Jones in Boston, who does a podcast, uh um a horror film podcast. And then uh, Michael Epstein and uh, his wife and uh, co-everything, uh, Sophie uh, Cacciola. I hope I pronounced her last name, Cacciola. What they've cool? done is, what they've done is, um, uh, to put it in, in uh, uh, context, and all the reviewers, if you read reviews of this, 90% of the reviews mention this. They have done for horror films and horror film conventions what Spinal Tap did for rock bands and rock concerts, right? So the, it's it's a complete send up, and to anchor their mythology, this this wonderful mythology that they've created, they created a whole genre of horror film called football uh, 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 porn, right? I- and horror like horror football slasher stuff, right? Then they shot sixty minutes of a fake film claiming it was, and then created a whole mythology about it being lost footage. And then on top of that, put this wonderful documentary about two guys who claim to have been the original Smash Mouth wanting to play the part again. I mean, just, they just, it's just brilliant. 
and the, uh, um, to anchor their reality, they went to uh, several legitimate horror film icon people to do talking head interviews throughout the documentary that give it credibility. Like I did one and said, oh yeah, Wes and Sean talked about Smash Mouth all the time. They were just, they, they just didn't know if Last House was ever going to like succeed against mm. this. And, you know, I just ad lived a whole bunch of shit and it's me and a bunch of real people, you know, from like Halloween and, you know, other movies that are well known. So when it comes out, I promise you a good time. It's just wonderful. You know, oh, should I, should I play the trailer here? It's about a minute and a half long. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, let's, let's add it to the stream here. We'll we'll stay on the stream as well. Let's do it like that. I think I'm actually, I think I'm actually in the tr one trailer for like a few seconds. Okay, well, let's, we'll find out. We'll find out if we see you in here. I'm trying to push play. Here we go. I think this should be the correct one. If it's not, stop me or let me know while it's playing. It doesn't matter. It, should, it deserves to be pressed. Yeah, that's Neil Jones. Without you. In 1970, at the height of the football revenge film craze, Mikey Smash and William Mouth both portrayed the football cannibal Smash Mouth in the cult hit End Zone 2. The film's influence on a small number of horror legends was immeasurable. Some even say it was Andy Warhol's favorite movie. <laughs> After a portion of the film was lost and the ownership rights were called into question, End Zone 2 simply disappeared. Now, 50 years later, Smash Blender Films is reviving the franchise. We're doing a reboot sequel of the movie End Zone 2, and it's going to be called End Zone. With the pending casting announcement at Mad Monster Party, Rivals Mikey and William will each do anything to reclaim their iconic role. They are joined by their reluctant assistant, AJ. Pick up that bag. I don't want those wheels to wear out. Mikey, William, and AJ must battle clowns, law enforcement, and holographic technology to find out who will be crowned the once and future smash. The once and future smash. There we go. That yeah. looks good. Yeah, yeah. I'm telling. You, I, I'm not. That must be a trailer. I'm not in, but um, uh, I have seen myself in a couple of them. I'm telling you, I'm so I'm so glad I did this. You know, I did. Neil called me. I knew Neil because I had done his podcast. And he called me up and he said, you know, this is what we're doing. Please do this. And then I went and I met Michael and Sophia. And, and I said to myself, this is just going to be terrific. And so I, I am a thousand percent behind this picture. Uh, um, these people are just terrific artists and had a vision and kept it through COVID. They kept their vision. You know, they, they said to stop and start and stop and start. And it's make, you know, making a movie is like hard enough when you can do it yeah. continually. So they they deserve everything that they should get from this uh, 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 just because they and it's beautiful. I, I mean, I watched it on a big screen at the premiere in L.A. at uh, uh, at the Chinese. Right, man. And it's just just, you know, I think Sophia was a cinematographer and she's wonderful. It's just amazing. Just what they did with, with such little resource, you know, such small resources. I'm happy that you brought that up because normally on this on the podcast, we do like to talk about things that are upcoming and, and new yeah. projects that people are working on. So I'm happy that you're able to plug that. And uh, it's 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 something new. And I was going to ask you, is there anything else that you're going to be working on or in the near future? And then we just um, like I'm I'm writing I'm writing a book about my life and my career. I'm halfway through it. It's called uh, 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 Dumb Effing Luck, uh, <laughs> the story of me and my very successful mediocre career. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm halfway through that and I'm back doing stand up. Uh, actually, I'm working March 1st uh, on a show here in near, near where I live. Just back, uh, 
you know, up on stage because that's where I feel really comfortable. You did some writing and producing as well. Uh, oh, lots for, of that, yeah. A lot of shows uh, seem like in the early '90s, like like Sister Sister. 80, late se- yeah, late '70s. Uh, uh, my first, uh, all the '80s, and up in th- some up to the mid 2000s. Did and did you get out of writing and producing, or are you still dabble in it? I still dabble in it. I still have a couple of things. I I'm I'm kind of at a point in my life where I don't. I'm very I'm comfortable. And, you know, shit's good. Right. So I, I, I'm not hungry. So I, I tend to, like, just do what I want. Yeah. Uh, I have, you know, I, I learned early on in my life that uh, when you reach a point, if you reach a point in your life, when you 100% own your own time. Mm-hmm. where you don't have to be anywhere you don't want to be unless you really want to be there absent doctors and shit, you know, where you got to go. Right. And my wife and I hit that point a few years ago. Um, and it, it's, you know, we, we balanced uh, uh, what we have with how we like to live and how long we think we're going to live and what we have, you know, and everything seemed to work out. So we, we, we live, um, we, we, uh, we've given up four days of the week in a sense, you know, like regular people, uh, uh, deal with the Mondays and the Tuesdays and the Wednesdays and the Thursdays. My wife and I have three days a week, yesterday, (laughs) today, tomorrow. That's it. (laughs) That's all we fucking deal with. You know, it's like uh, yesterday. Okay. I wasn't feeling well. I went to the doctor. He gave me some medicine today. I'm feeling much better tomorrow. Who knows? But that's it, man. It's like yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That's the only three days we care about. Eventually I will get, eventually, hopefully I will get there to where to my, my, I think my parents were that way too, but you gotta, you know, when you're young and I, I wouldn't say I'm super young anymore, but I'm 40, that's young enough still. I still, I still have to work, you know, I still have to put in the work before I can get there. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah, that's true. But I'm 73, man. You know, it's yeah. like, uh, that, that I'm on the other side of the Creek. <laughs> A very, very, very lively and upbeat for 73. I, I, I really feel when I was a kid, people who were 40 seemed way older. Yeah. And now I'm 40 and I still feel like I, mean, I watch these TV shows where they were, they were 25. They look like they're 50. You know, it's dude. Let me, tell you let me, let me tell you something. This is, this is something that when I was a kid, I would have never heard from a 73 year old man. And I'm going to tell you, and the truth is that my emotional age and my chronological age are now no longer in the same century. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Completely. You know, I'm stuck back in 19 something, something. Right. And my body is here in 2023. Yeah. Yeah. But do you ever ever meet people, do you ever meet people that are your age that seem so much older than you at 73? Like they look like they're getting, I already and you're here yeah it's a, it's a mental state also though isn't it well it's it's a lot it's a lot of things i lived a very unique life so you know i lived the kind of life that was um in a lot of common areas fundamentally stress-free right like yeah. i've never done anything but show business since i started you know, that's stressful. That, that would seem stressful, though. It would to me. It would seem yeah. like it is. Maybe it's not. Well, I had I had some stressful years on and off, right? When you know things were down, but I started without stress, right? Like I sold the first script I ever wrote. That's what moved me to California. Wow. And the and the day I landed in California to move here to relocate. I had already played the Copacabana with London Lee. Uh, I knew people. I had sold the first script. I had a car. I had an apartment. I had William Morris as an agent. Money in the bank. 
I, I don't know. It was, it was all, it was all just there for me. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just, you know, I have some writer friends uh, uh, whose nickname for me is the myth because, <laughs> because I sold the first script I ever wrote and when I knew nothing, right. Like it was just yeah. on a fucking luck. And um, so I've had years where things weren't good, but if on balance, looking back on everything, you know, it's been pretty cool. <laughs> you know, I had, I had three goals when I, I dropped out of college in 1969, I was at LSU. I went to school with actually David Duke, Merit, okay. one, one of yeah. big civil rights advocate, you know, but for white people. Um, so I dropped out of college then, and at 19, I had uh, uh, three life goals firmly in place. I wanted to smoke as much weed as possible. <laughs> okay. I was 19. I wanted to sleep with as many. I wanted to sleep with as many different women as possible, right? Who does? And on the it? practical on the, on the practical side, I wanted to make just enough money to afford the weed and the women. <laughs> right. So now I can tell you, I can, I can tell, I can tell you with a hundred percent certainty, I look back on my life and I have in any, every category greatly exceeded my own expectations. That's amazing. Congratulations. Congratulations for, for doing that. A lot of people, you know, and it's, I really feel like it it starts off young. I've known people and I've been managers of places and for, you know, not in the show business industry, but you see people in, I, I feel like there's a lot of excuse makers out there that just, I can't do this or woe was me for this. And I, I feel like that may continue on. And, and then they wind up dying younger because they don't have this positive outlook on life and they think everything's against them. And you seem very positive to me. And I believe that if you put positivity out there, positive things happen back to you. Listen, my father, my father exposed me to the concept that fortune favors the bold, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So with that in mind, you know, I look back and so many things in my life took place because I said, oh, fuck it. Who cares? You know, I don't give a shit. Right. And I just went ahead and did what I wanted. to. I just went ahead and did what what I thought was right. Right. Like. I became uh, I became a regular at the comedy store um, after only three Monday nights. Right. Three, three Monday nights. So when I moved to L.A., um, William Morris were my agents. They said, uh, what else do you want to do? You know? And I said, well, I, I, I want to do standup, right? I was doing, I was doing standup and I want to do that some more. So they called Mitzi Shore at the comedy store. And because she didn't know who I was, nor, nor should she, um, uh, you know, she said, well, I'll give him a Monday night, but I'll give him a time spot. So he doesn't have to stand in line. I'll give him, a, a, a definite time. So uh, uh, I went on Monday night, what, first night, you know, first I went to the comedy store uh, a couple of weeks before and I saw Steve Bluestein and uh, Tim Thomerson on the same show. And they were so freaking brilliant that I, I was going to quit that night. I said, no, fuck this. I'm, you know, that East coast, New York Catskill mountain shit that I, I was going to do just wasn't going to fly there. It was just wasn't going to work. So, Obviously, I didn't quit. I went and wrote five new minutes, right? Five uh-huh. new minutes of material. And I went on the first night. And, it, you know, first time I did it, it was fine. You know, it was, it was okay, by, very good by their standards at, for, for Monday night. But I had all that experience on stage. So it wasn't, but it was okay for me. So they invited me back. I did it. I used the material. I kind of took the week and, and I went back the second time around the same time spot. And uh, uh, it was better for me. You know, I, I got rid of some stuff that I knew wasn't going to work and whatever. So I worked on it again. They invited me back. Now, the difference was the third time I was there. Mitzi Shore, the owner of the club, the, the person who made people regulars, she uh-huh. was in her booth. She was there to showcase somebody else. So. I get this cherry time spot, like 1045, the two or three comedians on before me were doing, did great. Right. So the audience was way up 
Mm-hmm. I said to myself, you know, all I have to do to do a really great set is not lose them. Right. And uh, yeah, I told myself that, right? So, so yeah, but remember, I had done like 150, 200 club dates in the Catskills and the Copacabana. So this yeah. wasn't new for me. This was new for mostly everybody else. It wasn't new for me. So, so uh, um, they introduced me. I go on and I squeeze every fucking joke out of that five minutes. That I mean, there was like joke dust on the stage floor. There was nothing. It was dry. It was like gone. Fucking. So I walk off. I walk off to huge applause. The audience is going nuts. They're screaming because I, I had a big joke at the end. And I see Mitzi Shore sitting in her booth. And I said to myself, fuck it. What do I've got? What do I have to lose? So I walked over to her. I said, hey, Mitzi. And she knew who I was because I had introduced myself, you right. know, in the intervening three weeks. I said to her, I, I went like this with my hands. I said, Mitzi, really? Seriously? Does it have to get any better than this? Mm-hmm. And she just looked up at me and she said, all right, Mark, call in for spots. And that's how I became a regular. And that's wow. why my name, that's why my name's on the wall of the comedy store for like oh, 45 years or so. Wow. Wow. What an interesting story you have. And people that just that followed your, I guess, acting career, just a few things that you've done. Yeah. They probably, unless they know who you are, may not even realize that you're a comedian, especially going to these, when you go to these horror conventions and people remember you, uh, I think you mentioned going to some of these horror conventions earlier. Uh, they, they're all familiar with my writing, my, 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 my TV writing career. Okay. They are. Okay. Yeah. Mostly, okay. mostly they are. You know, not so much about the stand up, right? Uh-huh. But, but the, uh, you know, and where I was with Robin Williams and David Letterman and Jay Leno uh-huh. and all those guys, that that they, n- n- some do, but a l- nearly everybody talks about the TV shows I wrote. So, what's, what's your favorite, if you could pick a favorite thing to do in the entertainment industry, whether it's stand up, writing, stand up, stand up, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Yeah, there's nothing like it, man. Is it this? There's, there's, it's hard to explain. It's like I used to. I used to say doing stand up for me is like the most fun mm-hmm. I've I've ever had in my life with my clothes on. <laughs> right, right, right. Like, but now at seventy three, it's kind of like the most fun I've ever had. <laughs> you know, <it's, laughs> no, it is. Here's here's what it is, okay? Here's what it is. First of all, uh, I say this uh, uh, without shame. I'm my own favorite subject, okay? Yeah. So, so going out on stage and doing stand-up enables me to do that in to, to talk about myself and and just be me in a way that you know is is kind of acceptable. Because it gets a little intense in one-on-one situation when you do that. So the fact that there are all those people there that uh, and it and what I, I've talked to other comedians and kind of like everybody thinks a lot of the same things. There's a there's a lot of fun inside your head going on as a comedian when you've set up a really good joke and you know what the punchline is yeah. and you and you know in about two seconds the entire audience is going to go, whoa, and you're going to do that to them. Right. Yeah. Right. Then you get a tickle, man. Like I, I do that. I, I don't think that all the time. Right. Sometimes I'm thinking about something else, but it's, there's just, there's a, well, I'll tell you the story. You see that picture behind me? Yeah. See that? Yep. Black okay. And white. Yeah. So that's, that's me. A picture from my 10th birthday party. Okay. Wow. Uh, uh, when I was in the run up to my 10th birthday party, uh, uh, I was raised by a single father, like an aluminum siding salesman guy, like a really slick Cadillac driving binky ring, diamond ring wearing yeah. guy. Okay. So, so silk mohair suits, custom made shit. So, so that was my dad and he was an aluminum siding salesman. So he came to me before my 10th birthday and he said, hey, look, uh, you got your 10th birthday coming up. Uh, uh, that's a big deal. 10, new decade. You know, you go into it a little boy. You come out a young man. Uh, uh, gonna, I want to get you something special. No, no bullshit, you know, gift this year. I'm going to get you. So you just tell me what you want. 
So I just blurted out. I said, how about the Three Stooges? And he said, uh, all right, let me look into it. So <laughs> called a friend of his who was the booker at a nightclub in Pittsburgh called the Holiday House. Uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh. And he and the guy said, yeah, I, I know who their agent is in California. He said, they're playing here in January. Well, my birthday's in September. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mine too. Right on. Yeah. So, so, but the Stooges were due there in January. So my father talked to their agent and said, yeah, they'll do a Saturday afternoon matinee party for him, private party. And this is what it would cost and yada, yada, yada. Right. Uh -huh. so my, my dad came back to me uh, like a week later and he said, well, look, I got, I got some Stooge info for you. And I said, what? And he said, well, good news is I can get him and I can throw you one, a one hell of a 10th birthday party that, you and your friends will never forget. And he's right about that. Mm -hmm. And he said, on the other hand, I can't get him for your birthday. So the party will have to be in January when they're at the holiday house. He said, what do you think? I said, deal. I'm in. So at, at the party, I had about 60 friends, right? And their family and, you know, at this nightclub in, an after, in the afternoon. Stooges are up on stage doing their show. And uh, uh, in the middle of it, Mo stops the show and he looks out at the audience and he says, well, we're all here to celebrate Mark's birthday. Where's Mark? So I'm at a table and I raise my hand and he said, uh, uh, Mark, your dad tells me that uh, you're Pittsburgh's number one Stooge fan. So I, I blurted out, yeah, and uh, uh, I know all your material. Mm -hmm. So then Mo looks at me and says, well, I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> Come on up here. So my father, wise motherfucker that he was, leaned into me and said, no time to explain this now, but get your ass up on that stage. And and I went up on the stage. And audience went crazy, my friends. Right. So I'm on the stage. They hand me a microphone. And there I am on stage with the three stooges. And I'm doing their shtick. Right. I'm uh -huh. like Mo, Larry, the cheese, Niagara Falls, and I'm I'm taking on the curly roll, right? Uh -huh. And Mo is just like flabbergasted because I knew everything. Yeah, I watched them after school for years, for hours after school, right on TV. So I knew everything. So in the middle of that, Mo stops. He puts his hand on my forehead and he says, "I W the fourth stooge." <laughs> well, right on, Major. Right? Uh, yeah. Wait, wait. So then he does that. That 60 people applaud like they were 60,000 people, right? And I felt for the first time in my life, this thing, this tidal wave of warmth and comfort came over me. That applause manifested in like this giant hug. And it felt good. And that, you know, I, I isolate on this because I told you I'm writing a book, but that's the day, that's the moment in my life that my path got set in stone. That's the moment when I said, yeah, I want more of this. You knew what you wanted to do when, uh, when you were young, that, 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 that would, I would, you know, that would change, uh, your life path. Cause it's, it's such a moment as a child it, it just it had to been just very impactful uh it, it was it was wonderful and problematic simultaneously okay because because um uh it gave me my my foreshad my internal foreshadowing of my own future right mm. uh, uh sometimes kind of leaked in to the present and the the two time frames were incompatible like i was doing very poorly in algebra i never actually passed it but i was doing very poorly in the, in the first time i took it they sent me to the guidance counselor and he said he asked me he said why are you not you know you you're smart enough why I said, because I'm never going to need it. He said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, one, I, and I said to him, one of these days, I'll probably have accountants and business managers 
and they'll handle all this stuff for me. Yeah. And he said, what does that even mean? Right. And, and in my adult life, I've had accountants and business managers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you knew, you knew you were headed along, but I don't think algebra is very practical anyways. Uh, in, and, and really day-to-day life business math, maybe accounting, maybe, but algebra, I don't think I ever have to figure out what the X factor. The is. average person doesn't need to do more than add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Everything else is a jerk off. Yeah. Unless you're going, unless you're like going into the sciences, uh-huh. right? On, on a daily basis, who, you know, uh, uh, who needs to do comprehensive, you know, equ- equations, right? Yeah. I got, thr- I got thrown out of algebra class one day uh, uh, before the Christmas break, this teacher, Mr. Henry guy looked like two eggs. His body, this guy was like two eggs that were glued together with a mustache right on it. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so he writes this equation on the board, like X minus Z plus P times Q plus R, you know, divided by W equals question mark, right? And he, he writes down, he returns to the class and he said, I'll give you 25 extra points toward your grade if you can tell me what's wrong with this equation. So people were like scrambling. They're doing shit on, you know, but like these poor kids, like like they're going like this, trying to work, they're looking at the copying it down. I started laughing. And uh, 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 I raised my hand and he looks at me knowing I've never known. I, the only right thing I've, re- I've ever said was, you know, uh, I have to go to the bathroom. Right. So so he said to me, Mr. Scheffler, you know what's wrong with this equation? I said, yes, I do. He said, OK, well, why don't you tell the class and me what's wrong with this equation? I said, no vowels. <laughs> Fucking class erupts. He then looks at me and says, get out of my class yeah. and never come back. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I never want to see you ever again. Get out of my class. And what 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 they, the biggest complaint about me was that I had the ability to take over the class at a moment, like at the drop of, of on my whim, like I would just do something funny. Mm-hmm. And boom, because 38 kids laughed the way you just did. Yeah. You know, you, you know how to control an audience. Was, I, I would think it's probably also important when you're doing stand up, being able to control uh, the audience. And looks like you had that power or were able to understand how to do that at a young age. I, I always, I didn't realize it because I was doing it as a kid, but I got older when I started to perform uh, uh, a lot. Uh huh. I look at the audience like the audience is a really hot looking girl at a bar and I'm trying to go home with her this night, tonight. Good way of looking that's, at it, yeah. That's how I look at the audience. That's that's how I think of it. Well, I hope that most people, when they hit the age of 73, act like you, have a mentality like you. I, you know, very, up, very positive, a good mindset. I would love to see your comedy sometime. I'm never in California uh, I, every now and then, but even if I do go, I go to Northern California and I, I don't think you're planning you know, on doing any touring anytime soon, unless you are, uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I can. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm writing. I'm the last show I did, I did for a, like a 55 and older community. Mm-hmm. Right. And I wrote a bunch of material specific for that air, uh, target and it really scored. So I'm doing another older audience uh, theater thing in La Quinta. Like the show's at six o'clock, man. It's like the fucking early bird comedy show. (laughs) (laughs) This is like all you can laugh at six o'clock, right? (laughs) Right. So, so, um, uh, and then, but, but it's all the first show sold out. So I think they're adding a second show at eight 30. Right. But, I got to write that down. All you can laugh. Hang on one second. Wait, I have, that's pretty funny. I just ad libbed that. Oh, I laughed. <laughs> that's pretty good. Do you ever ad lib on on stage? Even though you have your your jokes written down, is there ever? I guess maybe there's a heckler or just you just. I do. I don't get no. I don't get hecklers because I'm you know because uh, uh, I rem- I did once and I reminded him that another syllable becomes elder abuse. 
So if they, <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I just, I, people don't, you know, everybody's weird these days. Back when I started it, you know, hecklers were like a gauntlet, man. Everybody went through it. Uh, uh, but now there's a sign up at the comedy store that if you heckle anybody there, they'll throw you out. Yep. Yeah. And I, everybody, I think it's a, all that woke stuff, which I'm totally in favor of on the positive side. Um, but you know, I, there, you know who Paul Mooney was, right? No, I don't think so. Maybe, maybe if I seen him or heard him, I might. Okay. Paul Mooney was a comedian who died a couple of, a little over a year ago. He was Richard Pryor's the main writer. Oh, okay. And Paul, Paul was very well known himself. Uh, uh, and pity the heckler that tried to mess with him. Let's say, let's say I, I saw him uh, uh, verbally slice up many people at, at 12 o'clock midnight when people were getting too much alcohol in them and thought they could mess with him. Mm-hmm. So, you know, but they don't do people. There aren't any hecklers anymore. Everybody's very polite, you know. Uh, well, you know, that, that's a good thing because sometimes people, you never know if someone would have the opportunity to be a really great comedian. They go on stage a first or second time. They get a heckler. They're not used to it. Then they just never want to go back on stage again. Now that, let, me, let me tell you something. Listen to me for a second. That would never happen. And the reason is that if somebody was destined to be a really great comedian, Mm -hmm. that would be nothing. That would, that may have hurt for a week or two or, but they'd still, they'd be right back to where none of that. That's true. They they would just do it. Nobody, nobody, uh, uh, I know who is a well-known comedy person. And I've through the years now come to know a lot of people. Nobody became that person because that's not who they really wanted to be. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, everybody, everybody I know was driven. That, that it, we, everybody was, had, had some, some engine inside of them that was pushing them forward. I, I think, I think that makes sense, but also, you never, you never know if it could have hurt somebody. But yeah, if they're destined to be a comedian, they're just not. Not everyone has that ego or that drive to go back and do it. But then, if they don't have that drive, they have no reason to be in the business, anyways, and never would have got into it to begin with. Yeah, yeah. Be hard yeah. being a comedian, Mark. I do want to thank you for coming on the show. Oh, let's, thank you for having me. Let's plug that uh, that new movie uh, again. What's it? What's it called? We the about Once that. and Future Smash. The Once and Future Smash. We watched the trailer to that earlier. Looking forward to it. That comes out in twenty. That comes out this year, correct? Yeah, I think it's it's making it's in the festivals right now. Okay. And after it makes its festival run, then they'll make their distribution deal. I know they've been offered a couple of them. They just didn't think they were right, but but we'll see. I don't know that this is uh, uh, it, it's going to be a a, a, a well known movie. It's it's terrific. It's just terrific. I want to follow some of your stand up and I want to know if you use that early bird special. Uh, <laughs> joke. Oh, yeah. If you do, I'll say he made it up on the loud spot. Hey, Mark, do me a favor and stare out there till after the outro song plays, please. I do want to thank Pantheon Podcast. I want to thank my producer, Sam. Uh, and I want to thank all of our listeners. Mark, thank you very much. Very right, thanks fun. for having me. It was fun. Personality. That's all the time we got. Mark, please stay right there. Peace out, rock on, and much love. This is the loud spot outro by nothing short of tragic. Is this all talk with no action? No. Is this my thoughts with distraction? No. Is this what I bought that's in fashion? Or is this the loud spot with Sebastian? Yes. Does nothing short of tragic have his back again? Yes. Does everything that's good really have to end? Yes. Our pimp hoes have to pimp show, so to get more episodes, make an order, this is over.